In this section, we'll be doing some problem solving using patterns. Inevitably, we're going to be doing a lot of inductive reasoning, where we are making assumptions about the patterns that we are seeing, just kind of continuing. Okay, um, so a sequence, we've already been using these so far, is just an ordered list of numbers. When I say ordered, I don't mean that they're necessarily increasing or that they're decreasing or that the order even makes any sense. The order could be totally random. It just means where the um, entries in the sequence show up matters. Like this, um, this sequence right here goes 1, 5, 2, 17, 4, negative 5, 67. Um, if I were to write this as like 1, 2, 4, 5, uh, 17, or maybe I put the negative 5 back here, just to kind of keep everything um, ordered. This is just a different sequence. Um, it's the same numbers, but I have changed the ordering. So if I'm saying that this sequence is an ordered list of numbers, I'm just saying that I put them in some order, right? Does, the order doesn't have to, you know, make sense. It's just some ordering, right? Order matters. Um, each entry in the sequence, we call it a term. So five is the second term of the sequence. We um, also obviously sometimes call it entry as I already have. Um, and we'll sometimes call the sequence a list, obviously, right? Because uh, the sequence is a list of numbers. Uh, so yeah, these are e each of these is just the uh, terms of the sequence. Um, Sometimes we'll use notation like a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3 to represent the first, second, and third entry in the series, or sorry, sequence. Um, and the nth term in the sequence would be denoted a sub n, where we're sort of treating n as a uh, variable in this case. The dot dot dots, if you haven't seen this notation before, just means that the sequence continues indefinitely. So the sequence this sequence right here, it doesn't stop at 60, uh, 67, it just kind of keeps on going right there. If I were to put like dot 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 and then like put 100 at here and then not have any dots after this, just you know, like a period or just like nothing after that, that means that this sequence, you know, it has some stuff happening between the 67 and the 100 that we don't know about, uh, but it has to end at 100. Uh, but if I don't include that right there. That just means that it just goes indefinitely. It's like an infinite sequence. Uh, sometimes we will start our sequence at um, like at uh, a sub zero. So basically like this, this is like, we sometimes call this like a, the indexing of the sequence. So this is, um, so zero is like the index of this term one is the index of this term, two is the index of this term, and so on. Um, we sometimes start our index at zero as opposed to one, because sometimes it kind of makes a little bit more sense, uh, especially in like real, real world contexts. Um, if we think about it like in terms of like time, if I wanted to create a sequence uh, where like the nth entry of the sequence is like the temperature after like n hours has passed, then this starting at zero would mean um, the temperature after zero hours have has passed, which would mean, you know, that's just what the temperature is like right now. So in some contexts, it makes more sense to start your indexing at zero um, as opposed to starting at one. This would be like, you're starting uh, keeping track like one hour from now, whereas it would make more sense probably to start just like zero hours from now, just like right now. Um, uh, just for consistency, just in our class, um, I am going to stick with starting at one, um, even though it can be advantageous to start at zero, uh, especially for like those real world contexts. Sometimes it's more advantageous for like coming up with formulas as well. Like the formulas will just kind of work out a little bit nicer if you start at zero. Um, but we're just gonna stick with a convention just for consistency and just go with this one in our class because the book tends to do that as well. And I wanna kinda um, just for consistency, not stray too far from what the book is doing. 
It's natural to ask a couple questions about these sequences, such as what's the next term in the sequence? We've already looked at stuff like that so far. And what's a formula for the nth term in the sequence? Um, difference tables can be one tool that we can use to find the next term in a sequence. So if I go 5, 9, 13, 17, 21, uh, I could create a difference table. So I could do this like in the way that I was doing it in the last video, where I think of this as like plus 4, plus 4, plus 4, plus 4, and then, oh, I should go plus 4 to get to 25 for this last entry right here. Uh, or I could think of this in terms of difference tables, uh, which is just going to be kind of doing the same thing, but just recording that information in a slightly different way. So the difference between 5 and 9 is just positive 4. Between 9 and 13 is 4. Between 13 and 7 is positive 4. So on and so on. And so the difference between 21 and that last, that next entry should also be 4. If the pattern we assume to continue, so that entry should be 25. So that's just what a difference table is. One thing that's um, convenient about difference tables is that um, it's a little bit easier easier visually to create like um, a second difference table so like you know it, it's not gonna make sense in this problem but like the difference between 4 and 4 is 0 the difference between 4 and 4 is 0 so you can kind of see that that second difference table would be like constant in this case let's get the 4 back it's thing um, so yeah, let's see that in the next problem as well. Let's create a difference table to find the next term in this sequence, 4, 10, 22, 40, 64. So here, the difference between 4 and 10 goes up by 6. 10 and 12, uh, sorry, 10 and 22 goes up by 12. 22 to 40, we're going up by 18. 40 to 64, we're going up by 24. Um, and so, uh, maybe you can, maybe you can't tell what this uh, next difference should be, but if you couldn't tell, um, you could just create a second difference table. Say like, oh, difference between 6 and 12, 6. Between 12 and 18 is 6. That's going to be 6. That next difference, that'll be 6. So the difference between 24 and the next entry in our first difference table, that should be 30. And so the difference between 64 and that next entry um, should be 30. So what's 64 plus 30? It's 94. So this is creating a second difference table. And sometimes, you know, maybe if you don't see the pattern in the second difference table, you could create a third difference table and, and, uh, and so on. It's not guaranteed to always be a useful thing, but it does end up kind of helping in certain situations. So I'll let you try the next two problems on your own. So create a difference table to find the next term in the sequence 54, 40, 28, 18. And then for the sequence 2, 4, 9, 19, 36. So I'll just kind of give you a couple seconds to um, give you a chance to pause the video, um, try the problems, and unpause, come back to this whenever you're ready. So in this first one, um, our difference table, um, these numbers are going to be going down by certain numbers. So you could, uh, if you wanted to, keep track of the sign right here. So keep this like to be a negative 14. You could just ignore the sign and just say we're just sort of going down by 14 every time. Um, I'll put the sign here just because. 40 to 28, we're going down by 12, so we'll put negative 12. 28 to 18, we're going down by 10. So what should we be doing for the next one? So maybe you can already tell that we're going to be going down by 8. But if you couldn't tell, um, then you could do a second difference table. So 14 to 12, negative 14 to negative 12. Um, that difference is 2. And that would, that would actually be a positive 2 because what's negative 14 plus 2? That is actually equal to negative 12. Um, negative 12 
plus 2 is equal to negative 10. Negative 10 plus 2 is equal to negative 8. And then what's 18 minus 8? That is positive 10. So 10 would be the next entry in that sequence. Okay, uh, the next one. Our first difference table would look like this. So 2 plus 2 equals 4, plus 4 equals 9, plus 10 gives us 19, plus 17 gives us 36. So I personally don't see a pattern uh, at this point right here, so I'm going to go ahead and create a second difference table. So 2 to 5, that gives us 3. 5 to 10, that gives us 5. 10 to 17 gives us difference of seven. And so here I can start to see my pattern. Um, if you didn't see the pattern, you could create a third difference table and say, all right, well, that difference is two, that difference is two, that next difference should be two. And so this should be, you know, seven plus two is nine. Um, what should this difference over here be? 17 plus nine is uh, 26. And what should this entry that we're actually looking for B, well, it's just going to be 36 plus 26, which is um, 12 plus 50, so that should be 62. So 36 plus 26 gives us 62, so 62 would be the next term in that sequence. Looking back at example two, our sequence was 4, 10, 22, 40, 64, and so on. Uh, yeah, and then 94 came, came afterwards. Um, it turns out that a formula for the nth term of this sequence is 3n squared minus 3n plus 4. Let's check that to um, see if that actually holds true. So a sub 1, that would mean that n is equal to 1. And so I have to plug in a 1 every time I see an n over here. So 3 times n squared, n is 1, minus 3n plus 4. So 3 times 1 squared minus 3 times 1 plus 4. So this is 3 minus 3 plus 4. This equals 4. a sub 2 would be 3 times 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 4. So this would be 3 times 4 is 12. 3 times 2 is 6. 12 minus 6 plus 4, uh, that's, this is equal to 6. 6 plus 4 is equal to 10. So a sub 2 should be equal to 10. So that works out too. Uh, a sub 3, hopefully this should give us 22. Um, this will be the last one that I do here. Uh, so 3 times 9 is 27. 27 minus 9 plus 4, that's 18 plus 4, so that does give us 22. Okay, cool. So I'm more or less convinced here. Um, you know, this is like, I'm not, I haven't proved anything. This I'm kind of like using inductive reasoning here, right? I'm just sort of assuming that, you know, it worked for like the first couple. So I'm assuming that hopefully it should work for like the next couple after that, even though I don't necessarily know for sure this to be true. Um, but I, if I were told this information that this formula does hold true for this, um, for this sequence, I could then ask like, you know, what is the hundredth term of the sequence? And I wouldn't have to figure out like the whole difference table and all of that. Like I could really just plug in a hundred into this and figure out what I get. a sub 100 is three times like 100 squared minus three times 100 plus four. Three times 100 squared, that's gonna be like, I add on four zeros, minus 300 plus four. So this is like um, 30,000 minus 300. So that's like 29,704. If I were to um, do that addition right, hopefully. Um, yeah, yeah, that looks, that looks good to me. 
Um, so yeah, without having to figure out like the 10th term and then the 11th and the 12th and like just have to do everything in order using like that difference table or something, just figuring out the pattern and so on and so on. Having this formula is really valuable because then I could just say um, exactly what each entry in the series or in the sequence is going to be without having to um, do all of the work of like leading up to it. I can just say like, this is what a sub 100 is. This is like what the hundredth term. I could tell you what the thousandth term is, like what the 817th term is and so on. It's just really useful. Okay. Um, let's do a problem where we're actually finding a formula. So here we're going to let um, our sequence be defined by just the number of tiles in each um, figure of the sequence. So let's get let's get an nth term formula for the number of tiles in the nth figure of the sequence. So this is going to be the first entry of the sequence. So this is going to be five. Um, this second entry in the se sequence is going to be let's count it uh, five, eight. This looks like eight. This next one will be um, eight, eleven. Uh, this next one looks like 5 plus 5 plus 4 looks like 14. Okay. Um, so there's a couple ways that you could go about doing this. Um, and let's see. What would... All right. So this is going to be a sub 1. This will be a sub 2. This will be a sub 3. This will be a sub 4. Um, so what does a sub n look like? So a sub, um, a sub two, we have three things on the bottom, three things on the top, and then two things in the middle. A sub three, we have four on the top and bottom, and then three in the middle. A sub four, we have four in the middle, and then five on the top and the bottom. So a sub n, we probably would have um, n tiles in the middle, and then um, n plus 1 tiles up here, and then n plus 2 tiles, sorry, n plus 1 tiles down here as well. Right, so a sub 3, this would be n is equal to 3. Um, over here, n plus 1 is equal to 4. And then down here, n plus 1 is also equal to 4. Right, for a sub 4, n plus 1 is equal to 5. n is equal to 4. n plus 1 is equal to 5. So a sub n, um, our formula for a sub n would hence just be, well, we have n tiles in the middle and then n plus one tiles on the top and the bottom. So two times n plus one. You could um, go ahead and simplify this to n plus two n plus two or just three uh, n plus two. Okay. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. You could have also just saw a pattern in those numbers that we did. So this is gonna be um, option number two that you could do this problem. There's gonna be like a bunch of ways of like going about doing these problems. Um, so we had five and then we had, what was it? Eight and then 11 and then 14. You could notice that um, these are always like going up by three. So for every increase of one, it's going to go up by three. So it's going to be three n and then plus something. Well, a sub one starts at five. And if I were to plug one into three n, I would get three. So I have to add an extra two here to get that. So three times one plus two is equal to five. Three plus two um, times two is equal to three times two plus two. That's six plus two or eight. If I were to plug three into this, this is gonna go up by an additional three. And we're just gonna keep going up by three every time. That's why there's like the three N right there. Okay. 
Um, cool. And let's see, do I want to do another option? Yeah, I'm just going to go to the other option. Uh, ignore like the part B for here. I'm just going to show you maybe one last option for doing this. Um, the last option would be to just sort of notice that each of these is like almost a rectangle, um, but it has like this like square cut out from the middle. So this is like a sub four, right? So a sub three, a sub two, a sub one. Um, so we're cutting out a four by four, but we have a five by six uh, rectangle that's going on here. So we have a five by six rectangle of tiles. So five times six tiles. And then we subtract um, a four by four square in the middle. Similar to, for like a sub three, we have like a four by five. So we have a four by five and then we're cutting out a three by three. And then for a sub n, um, so if n is four, this five right here would be n plus one. And the two would be n plus, sorry, the six would be n plus two. So for a sub n, we would have an n plus one times an n plus two rectangle minus an n by n square in the middle. So drawing the picture of what that kind of looks like, we have the n by n in the middle and then n plus one by n plus two on the sides. So n plus one times n plus two minus n by n, or you could call that n squared as well. Uh, and if you were to simplify this, so this would be n squared plus 3n plus 2 minus n squared. If you simplify it down, you end up getting that same answer of 3n plus 2. So again, many ways of thinking about doing this. Uh, and this is really nice too, because now if I wanted to ask, finally, how many tiles are in the eighth figure of the sequence, all I have to do is plug 8 into this answer down here. So a sub 8 is equal to... 3 times 8 plus 2, 24 plus 2 is equal to 26. So the answer is there are 26 tiles in the eighth figure. I could then ask which figure will consist of exactly 320 tiles. Um, so I don't actually necessarily know if there are is going to be a figure with 320 tiles. Uh, but um, if, I'd, if we did, so we would say, well, we're asking when a sub n is equal to 320. So a sub n is equal to 3n plus 2. So we set that equal to 320. And then we solve for n. So 3n is equal to 320 minus 2. So 318. And then n would be equal to 318 divided by 3. Uh, what's that equal to? Well, this is the same as like 300 um plus 18 we divide both of those by three we would get 100 plus six so n would be equal to 106 um so a sub 106 in other words would equal 320 so figure number 106 will have exactly 320 tiles uh, here's a similar one. What is the nth term formula for the number of tiles in the nth figure of the following sequence? So here we have just like a square and then um, and then the square just kind of like turns into almost like a triangle uh, and the triangle just kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, all right, so this will be a sub one, which equals one. a sub two is equal to 3, a sub 3 is equal to 6, a sub 4 is equal to 10, um, and you could keep kind of going and so on and so on. So let's kind of look for patterns here. So again, there's going to be like a bunch of ways that we could go about doing this. I'll just show you maybe one or two of them. So for the first one, um, let's think in terms of like 
well, we're, we're always just sort of building. So here we have a sub one that shows up right here. And then we're just adding two squares on top of it. Then to go from a sub two to a sub three, we take that, um, that little L right there. And then we just tack on another three for a sub four. We take the previous thing and then add on four for a sub five. We'll just take this guy and then we will just add on five, right? We'll just add on five things. So a sub one is equal to one, a sub two, we could think of this as one plus two. And then a sub three is gonna be the previous thing, but plus three, a sub four is gonna be the previous thing, but then plus four. And then the next one will be plus five, a sub n, will be we keep adding these and then we stop at when we add n. Okay. Um, so here is, uh, so this is technically a formula, but because we have these dot dot dots in here, it's like a lot harder to say like, okay, well, what's a sub 100 equal to? Well, technically, you know, it is one plus two plus three plus up through 100. But like, what number is that? Like, it would be a lot easier if I could just plug a number in into just a formula that doesn't have any dot dot dots that have to make me like actually compute it by hand. Like, that's really annoying. I like want, so we would call this like sort of like an open formula. We want a closed formula. A closed formula means that there's like not any dot dot dots in there. So the dot dot dots are like sort of bad for a formula. So here's here's a common trick that you could do here. Um, so if you're in a group, uh, let's see, let me do it with like one through eight. Okay, if I were to group the one and plus the eight first, that would give me nine. I could then just sort of work my way towards the middle. Two plus seven, that's also nine. Three plus six, that's also nine. Four plus five, that is also nine. So if I just add all of those together, that's gonna be the same as like four times nine. So you could just sort of do it that way, just sort of grouping things together. Um, it gets, a little bit more annoying to do that trick if you uh, if you like have an odd number of terms here so like one plus up through like nine because then you would you could group like the one and the nine that makes ten two and the eight makes ten three and the seven makes ten four and the six makes ten but then you just have like the one five by itself so that gets like a little bit annoying one thing that you could do instead would be so this is a sub nine right um, and this is also a sub nine. You could just like reverse the order of this. And then you could take this and add it to this. So we're basically taking a sub nine and we're adding it to itself or doubling it. And then we would have 10 plus 10 plus 10, right? I'm just adding this term to that, this to that, this to that, this to that is 10, this to that is 10. That's 10, that's 10, that's 10, that's 10. How many things do I have? Well, I counted from one through nine, so there are nine of these terms. So it's nine times 10, um, which is 90. So two times a sub nine is equal to 90. So a sub nine is equal to half of that, which is 45. Okay, uh, I'm running out of space, so I'm gonna maybe shrink this. Um, now say, well, what about a sub n? So a sub n is equal to this. Um, so if I were to do the same trick over here, n plus n minus one plus n minus two plus, and then it goes all the way down to one, do this. So n minus one would just be the term that comes like before the, before the n, right? If I were to like put what goes here, this would just be n minus one. Mm -hmm and then add these things together, I get two a n is equal to n plus one plus, and then what's two plus n minus one, that's also n plus one. 
and then I just kind of keep doing that, and I get a bunch of n plus ones. How many of them are there? We're counting from one through n, so this is n times n plus one. So two a n is equal to n times n plus one, so a sub n is n times n plus 1 over 2. OK, so this is a closed formula for this. So now I could just go ahead and say, well, what is a sub 1,000? I could actually just plug it in. I get 1,000 times 1,000 plus 1 all over 2. And that's just what it is. You could put that in the calculator. It'll give you um, a number. Uh, but you just you just have to sort of compute it or you could just multiply you know thousand over two is like 500 so whatever 500 times a thousand and one is uh, I'm not gonna do it uh, but you certainly could okay um, let me sh uh, let's see oh yeah and then how many tiles are in the eighth figure again a sub eight that's gonna be uh, eight times eight plus one over two. So this is four times nine, dividing the eight by the two here, so 36. All right, let me show you one more way of doing this, and that would be to do the following trick. So, so if I were to double the picture um, and then just sort of flip it on its head, I could now, let's see if I don't zoom it improperly, Come on. Gosh. <laughs> Close enough. All right. Um, so if I were to do this, then basically I now have a four by five rectangle, right? So I have a four by five rectangle. And I've doubled the number of things in my um, in my picture. So this was like a sub four, and if I double it, then I now have a four by five rectangle. So then a sub four would just be that four by five rectangle, but just half of that to just compensate for that original doubling. And then you could do the same thing for a sub n. Two times a sub n, well, here n is taking the place of this side and then n plus 1 is taking the place of that side so we get n times n plus 1 so a sub n would just be that divided by 2 so that would just be another pictorial pictorial way of seeing that all right cool so that was a lot um i want to just end this with something called the fibonacci sequence um, the Fibonacci sequence, uh, okay, so it's, it's technically defined by some rules. Uh, the first term of the sequence is 1. The second term of the sequence is also 1. And then what would the next term of the sequence be? f sub n equals f n minus 1 plus f n minus 2. What does this mean? So basically what this means is... Um, is that, well, I already know what f sub 1 and f sub 2 are. They're both equal to 1. So what would f sub 3 be? According to this formula, f sub 3 is equal to f sub 3 minus 1. Uh, 3 minus 1 is 2, plus f sub 3 minus 2. What's 3 minus 2? That's equal to 1. So this is equal to f sub 2 plus f sub 1. So really this is saying that f sub 3 is going to be the sum of the two terms that came before it, f2 plus f1. So those in this case are both 1, so that tells us that f sub 3 is equal to, equal to 2. So let's list out our sequence up here. So we have f1, we have f2, we have f3. And then what would f4 be? Well f4 would be equal to f... Um, f sub 3 plus f sub 2, so just the sum of the two terms that came before it. So 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. What would f sub 5 be? f sub 5 would be f sub 4 plus f sub 3. So that would be 2 plus 3, which equals 5. 
The next term would be the sum of the two terms that come before it, 3 and 5, that makes an 8. Then I do 5 plus 8, that gives me 13. 8 plus 13, that gives me 21. 13 plus 21, that's equal to 34, and so on. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. It's a very famous sequence. Um, shows up like all the time, like in nature. Um, you can kind of like Google that. I won't really go into that here, but um, very famous sequence. I'll just do like a couple true false questions just to end out the video. Uh, example seven, determine whether the following statements are true or false. Um, 2fn plus 4 is equal to fn plus 3 for n greater than or equal to 3. Um, when I say for n greater than or equal to 3, I mean like for all grant n greater or equal to 3. Okay. So um, let's list out our sequence again. So 1, 1, 2, 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13, and so on. Um, and then this was f1, this was f2, this was f3. So if I were to start with, um, let's just kind of do a couple values at a time, starting at n equals 3. Uh, 2 times f sub 3 plus 4, what is that equal to? Uh, well, f sub 3 we said was equal to 2. So it's 2 plus 2, or 2 times 2 plus 4, which does equal 8. Uh, what is f sub n plus 3? because that's what it's saying that this is equal to. f sub n plus three, that's equal to f sub six. So four, um, f sub five, f sub six. So in this case, f sub six actually is equal to eight. So these two things are equal. Okay. Um, so it looks like it's true for um, at least an equal to three, but what about like for other n? So like if I were to do n equals four, does this work for that as well? Um, so two times f4 plus four, f4 is three. Um, so this is two times three plus four. So that's six plus four, that is equal to 10. Um, what is f sub, uh, f sub four plus three, so f sub seven? Well, that would be this over here. That would actually be 13. So in this case, these two things are different. They are not equal. And so this one would be false because it's not true for all n greater than or equal to 3. Just because it's true for the first, um, for like one example, does not mean that it's true for all examples. Uh, and so we've now found a counterexample. And so this lets us conclude that this is false. I'll let you try this last one just to finish out, uh, finish out the video. Um, so pause this one, see if you can determine whether 2fn is greater than fn plus 1 for n greater than or equal to 3. I'm going to assume that you've paused and tried the problem and are now ready to go over. All right, so for n equals 3, so here is f sub 3, starts at um, the entry 2. Um, so f sub 3, two, if I were to do 2 times f sub 3, is that greater than f sub 3 plus 1, so f sub 4? Well, 2 times f sub 3, that's 2. Uh, and then f sub 4 is equal to 3. So this is saying that 4 is greater than 3. And uh, that, of course, is a true statement. So this one would be a solid yes. So, so far, so good. But again, we've seen before, like, just because it's true for the first one doesn't mean that it's true for all of them. So what about 2 f4? Is that greater than f sub 5? f sub 4 is 3, so 2 times 3, is that greater than the next entry, which would be, um, well, f sub 5 actually is equal to 5. And yes, 6 is greater than 5. Let's do it for the next one. Um, is 2 times 5 equal to 
uh, greater than 8? Yes, it is. Is 2 times 8 greater than 13? Yes, it is. That's 16. What about 2 times 13? Is that bigger than 21? Well, 26 is bigger than 21, so it looks like it. Is 2 times 21 bigger than uh, 34? That's 42. 42 is certainly bigger than 34. And it looks like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So it actually does seem like this one would be true. So if we were to use inductive reasoning, we're not using deductive reasoning at all. We're really just sort of looking at a pattern and saying, well, it's true for like the first however many. So it seems like it should be true in general. So using inductive reasoning, we can conjecture that the answer would be yes, but we're not actually mathematically proving anything. And so we'll just kind of leave it as a, uh, as a conjecture. We'll just say, seems like it's true. Um, and again, we're not, we're not claiming, yes, this is definitely true. We are just saying, you know, based off of these examples, it seems likely to be true. Okay, so we would leave that as a conjecture, uh, not a statement of fact.